We're very fortunate to have a lecture on the Spath grading system by George Spath himself. Dr. Spath has contributed a longer lecture on gonioscopy, which is found elsewhere in this website, but I've extracted the portion that deals only with his grading system to include here. I would encourage you to look at the entire lecture under the introduction heading. There are three dimensions of configuration that you have to consider. You have to consider this angularity, also where the iris sticks on. Does it stick on there at Suave's line? Or does it stick on back there in ciliary body? As in this case, too. And then you also have to consider the curvature of the iris. So, angularity, insertion, and configuration. Is it curved or is it flat? Now, this gonioscopic grading system is a method of considering all those aspects quantitatively and then putting them in a system which is easy to remember and which will be easy to record. First, let's talk about the iris insertion. There are five different places that we've described that. One is A, anterior to Schwab's line, B, behind Schwab's line, and B, by the way, is the weakest part of this whole system because behind Schwab's line encompasses a lot of important areas. C, one can see squirrel spur, but nothing behind squirrel spur. So a B angle is between squirrel spur and Schwab's line. So a B angle could be closed, or B angle, if it was adherent up here, or B angle could be open. But a B angle shows that the iris insertion is between squirrel spur and the anterior trajectory meshwork. Excuse me, and the uh, Schwab's line. Okay, D for deep. D means one can see the ciliary body, the anterior portion of the ciliary body. E is extremely deep. So in an E angle, one can see approximately a millimeter of the ciliary body. So this is the iris insertion. A, anterior to Schwab's line. B, behind Schwab's line. C, squirrel spur is visible. D, ciliary body is visible. E, a millimeter of ciliary body is visible. That's the iris insertion component of the configuration. Then there's the angularity, the part that's considered in Schaefer's system. And this needs to be considered by thinking of the a tangent to the posterior surface of the cornea and a tangent to wherever the iris is. This can be pretty accurately evaluated. Um, Grace Owen and I did a study which we reported in the Transactions of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which we used UBM to validate what the actual angularity was, and then we used gonioscopy, and we found we could quite reliably be within five degrees of what the UVM found. Interestingly, I tend to overestimate, and Dr. O tend to be a little bit underestimating. So if one is going to use this system, probably it's a good idea to validate your ability to do this with some UVM patients in order to make sure that you can get that fairly accurately. It doesn't have to be more accurate than that. That's plenty good. What we're really interested in is not whether it's 5 or 7 or 10, but is it 5 or 20? So there's some range of variability, but the amount of variability doesn't need to be excessive. So this is simply looking at the angularity, 
by creating a tangent on the posterior surface of the cornea and then a tangent on the anterior surface of the iris. Second component, the angularity of this angle. Third component, this has to do with the curvature of the iris. And this is an essential part. Now, this was not my contribution. It was originally described by great gonioscopist from South America, Busaka. And he described this many years ago in his wonderful atlas of gonioscopy. It's an interesting phenomenon why so many things are described and ignored. This is a really essential part of describing the anterior chamber angle. Why was it that nobody paid any attention whatsoever to Busaka's important contribution? That's the subject for another lecture. But when I first started this, I used different letters. But some people found them confusing. So we've We've changed these a little bit, and what we used to call an R for regular, we now call an F for flat, because that flat, of course, can be this direction or it can be anywhere, but it's, there's no bowing to the iris. It's a flat iris. In contrast, when the iris has a rather regular bow, it could be slight, just a little bit bow like that, or it could be marked like this, then that's put down with a lowercase b. So this is lowercase f for flat, lowercase b for bowed. A plateau iris in which there is a sudden steep rise and then it flattens out. Definition of a plateau is designated by a p, p for plateau. So plateau iris sudden steep rise and then flat. And an iris which bows posteriorly so it's concave is the C. Now, I want to go back a little bit because is it important to understand the whether there really is an A or a B or a C or a D? Does it matter? Well, yes, it does. It matters not only because of the presence of, obviously, anything anterior to a C is pathologic, but also, way back here, it also matters because certain types of angles are characteristic of certain ethnic groups. In Caucasians, most Caucasians, the angle tends to be more deeply inserted. In brown-eyed Caucasians, it tends to be a little more anteriorly inserted. Patients of African extraction, it's a little more anterior than in most Caucasians. So let's continue on with this now to show how these are put together into a grading system. So now we have an angle that looks like this. And First of all, let's just describe it. The iris inserts into the ciliary body, anterior ciliary body, so that would be a D. It bows anteriorly, markedly, but flattens out, so that would be a P, a plateau. The Approach to the angle is probably somewhere around 30 degrees, so that's a 30 degree. But we don't have it written down that way. What, why do we have it written this way and what does this mean? Well, on looking at this angle, the view through the angle, one cannot see past the posterior trajectory meshwork. So this is looks like a B angle. Looks as though the iris is inserting, inserting somewhere around here. So we call this a B angle. But it's not a B angle. 
So this is put in parentheses, because in actuality, it's a d-angle, which you can only tell from Max Forbes' indentation goniospa technique. So when you push on the cornea, you displace the aqueous, this increased pressure here pushes this iris back. There's nothing to support it there. So the iris gets pushed back. You end up then with an iris that bows posteriorly. You know that's a D. Now, are there disadvantages to goniosopy done with an annotation technique? Yes, there are. There are major disadvantages. And David Campbell, great gonioscopist, great contributor to the field also, was not a fan of indentation gonioscopy. He said what happens is people push against the cornea and they inadvertently deepen the anterior chamber and make the angle look deeper than it really is. A real danger. One of the reasons, one of the ways one can avoid that is by insisting on gonioscopy that you see absolutely clearly. Because if you're indenting, you're bending this a little bit, and you tend to get stria, and you don't see so clearly. If your view of this angle is not absolutely crystal clear, insist on knowing why. Is it due to a corneal dystrophy, corneal gatata? By the way, gonioscopy is a really nice way to look at corneal gatata. Is there some other media problem? Or are you creating an optical media problem by pushing on the eye, bending the cornea, and then not seeing the angle as clearly as you should. So with an annotation gonioscopy, you have to be very, very gentle. Just touch that cornea. Now, the way I put on the lens in patients when I use the indentation lens, which is what I use routinely, is you're seated at the slit lamp. You don't look around the side of the patient as you do when you're putting on a Goldman. You're seated at the slit lamp. You're in focus. You've got the oculars in focus. The patient's anesthetized, and you tell the patient, now just look straight ahead. You're going to feel this, but it won't hurt you. Then with them looking straight ahead, looking through the microscope, you place the mirror on the coin. The immediate response is the patient's going to squeeze. So for a moment, you have to hold it quite firmly, because you have to hold it firmly enough that when the lids come down around the mirror, it doesn't pop that out. But that, will, but that firmness will be much too firm to allow you to see well. So once they blinked a couple times, then they start to relax. Then you pull back until you get a little bit of a bubble so you know that you, you're not in contact with the cornea anymore. Remember, of course, with an annotation technique, you don't use any gonoscopic gel. That's one of the other advantages of it. So you're not using any gel, so you very quickly lose contact. So you pull that back, then you just hold it feather touch on the cornea. Then I usually start with the looking at the inferior angle, so I start with the superior mirror because it's usually a little deeper, a little easier to see the landmarks inferiorly. So I look at the inferior angle, then crank it up, look at the superior angle. Usually you don't need to look at the temporal and nasal angles. Sometimes you do if you're looking for uh, fine blood vessels in Fuchs or for psychodialysis cleft, or for an angle cleavage. Yes, there are lots of times when you're going to need to look at the 3 and 9 o'clock position. But by and large, the two areas that you need to look at and that will be adequate for almost all gonioscopies are the 12 o'clock position and the 6 o'clock position. So, now got the lens on there, and you're looking, and what you see is you can't see past the post direct meshwork. So you say in your mind, B. Then you indent and you see, whoop, it's actually a D. So now you say parentheses B and the parentheses D. It's a 30 degree, it's a P. 
then you do that at the 12 o'clock position. Then you record it. And the way you record it is simply by, I usually draw a circle if the angle is different in different parts. If it's all the same, 360 degrees, I just write down parentheses B and parentheses D, 30 P. So there you've described the entire angle. You've said exactly what it's like, and it's taken you, what, 10 seconds to write it down. That works in a busy clinical practice. Now, I have something else on here, too, 0 PTM. And we'll get into this before we go into the next part of the grading. One of the thoughts I'm going to try to leave you with is that gonioscopy is not going away. UVM is great, but it doesn't tell you what you need to know in most people. Visanti OCT won't tell you what you need to know because they don't tell you anything except this configuration. You also need to know what the posterior tubercular mask work looks like. Is it pigmented? Is it not pigmented? What color is the pigment? Is the pigment different at the 6 and 12 o'clock positions? For example, an interesting phenomenon I don't understand, but in patients with the exfoliation syndrome, the pigment tends to be blackish, and with the pigment dispersion syndrome, it tends to be brown until it gets very dense. Furthermore, with the exfoliation syndrome, the pigmentation of the posterior tract meshwork is more intense inferiorly, whereas in pigment dispersion syndrome, it's more intense superiorly. So we also need to know the type and the amount and the position of the pigmentation in the posterior tract meshwork. And I don't usually, oh, this is a typo I see. It's PTM, of course, not PMT. So zero PTM would be no pigment in the posterior tract meshwork. Now let's look at another case. So here's a patient now who, when you put the lens on, you can see this is deep. It's almost an E. That would be one of those places where you decide, well, is that a D, is that an E? It's certainly very deep. Along that line, who else has angles like this? In what sort of situation are you likely to see a very deep angle? Any patient who is a myope. Myopes usually have very posteriorly inserted angles. Hyperopes have much more anterior inserted angle. So here is a D, and here, well, it's hard to say anything, maybe even more than a 40, maybe it's a 50. It's clearly a very deep angle, and the angle is posteriorly concave. And there is very dense pigmentation of the posterior tract meshwork, so it's a D40C with 4 plus PTM. Let's see if I've got, yeah, let's we'll go back on that. So those are the two extremes of gonioscopy, the B angle. Okay, let's, let's go back now and hypothesize for a moment. Let's say the angle, instead of coming up like this, the angle went right across like that. What would that be graded? No, that's not plateau. Angle sticks there, goes right across it. This is a plateau. Hmm. That's a plateau. What would it be if it stuck there and just goes right across like that. A, 40, F, A, 40, F. What's the diagnosis in a patient who has an angle that's an A, 40, F? Of course it's angle closure. But what kind of angle closure? Would that be primary angle closure? 
No. Of course it's synecule. But what's the diagnosis? What's the most likely cause for an A40F angle? A secondary angle. Neovascular glaucoma. Almost 100%. Not always, but almost, almost certainly. That would be a neovascular glaucoma. Now, what if you saw an angle in which it was rather like this drawing of Max Forbes, in which, but it wasn't quite like this. It was deep in some places and other places, came way up like that, all sorts of ratty PAS. What's that likely to be? An exit field. Chandler syndrome or uveitis. So, depending upon where that is, it's very easy to grade that by just using those few descriptors, and that will give you a complete description of the configuration, but you also have to include, as I say, other aspects such as the amount of pigmentation of posterior tract meshwork. If that varies from one place to the other, just draw a circle and put the denominators either over the, you know, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, or wherever it is that you need to do that.